today I'm going to give you two different interpretations of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And yes, it is a parable. So in Luke chapter 16, the Bible talks about a parable called the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who lived it up. He was wealthy and there was a beggar called Lazarus who begged, obviously. That's kind of what beggars do. So both died and in the afterlife, their roles were reversed. We see the poor man, Lazarus, being comforted in the bosom of Abraham and the rich man being tormented consciously in the flames of hell or Hades. So the rich man cries out, uh, Abraham, send Lazarus that he will give me some water to drink. And Abraham says, no, there is a gulf between us and nobody could go back and forth. And he says, okay, well, I have brothers on earth who don't know about this place and they might come here too. Could you please send Lazarus? Send me, send Lazarus, do something. And Abraham said, no, they have Moses and the prophets and if they don't listen to them, they're not going to listen to anybody who comes back from the dead. So that's the parable. First thing I want to point out, this is a parable. There are some people who believe that this is not a parable. It is actually a historical narrative of two people who actually existed. And they even have a name for the rich man. They say his name was Dives. It turns out that Dives is simply a Latin word that means rich. So essentially, the rich man's name was Mr. Big Bucks. It might as well have been Creflo Dollar. The reason people say it's not a parable is because the parable begins, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple. There was a beggar called Lazarus. The fact that it's using there was, they interpret that to mean these people actually existed. But that is just a language of parables in the book of Luke. If you look at Luke 15, 11, it says, a certain man had two sons, and then he gave the parable of the prodigal son. Right there in Luke 16, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and he gave the parable of the unjust steward. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. There was a widow in that city and he gave the parable of the persistent widow. That is the language that the book of Luke uses to describe parables. In the book of Matthew, you will see the kingdom of heaven is like unto different language to introduce the, the parables. But in the book of Luke, he uses that kind of historical narrative language to introduce the parables. So that in and of itself does not make it a historical narrative. It's a parable. Now I'm going to give you two different interpretations. And before I give you those interpretations, let me give you some brief background information. The Jews in the time of Jesus believed that when people died, their bodies decayed in the ground, but their souls went to an underground place called Hades, which was divided into compartments. The Jews believed in two compartments. The Greeks actually had four compartments. Right? But the Jews believed that the righteous dead would go into paradise, where they would be comforted by the saints who went before them. And... Uh, the unrighteous dead went to a fiery place of torment, awaiting final judgment. So with that background information, Jesus is now giving this parable about the rich man being tormented in Hades. And there are only two possible interpretations. One, Jesus was validating what the Jews believed about the afterlife. Or two, he was invalidating it. And we will get to that interpretation second. But let's talk about interpretation number one. The interpretation that says Jesus was being literal and he was validating the Jewish belief that there is a two compartment uh, place called Hades where the righteous and the unrighteous went before the resurrection of Christ. So according to interpretation number one, uh, the rich man was literally in a fiery place being tormented and Lazarus was literally in the bosom of Abraham and there was literally a gulf between them and whatnot. And of course, people who believe in eternal torment in hell will gravitate towards the literal interpretation, number one, because it validates the idea of somebody being tormented in fire. So let's talk about the strength and the weaknesses of this interpretation. The main strengths are 
is literal. That's clearly what the passage is saying. Another strength is that this is how parables are normally used in the Bible. Parables are realistic, real-world stories that are used to convey spiritual truths. So if Jesus is using this story to communicate some kind of truth, then this story has to be realistic and real-world. So that validates the idea that there is a conscious intermediate afterlife where the wicked people are burning consciously in hell. But as compelling as that interpretation is, it does have weaknesses. One weakness is that it represents the only place in the entire Bible where it teaches that after people die, there is a conscious intermediate afterlife where wicked people go to a place called Hades where they are tormented in fire and the righteous go to paradise. It is the only place in the entire Bible where it teaches that and it happens to be in a parable. That is weak. And as I will show you in a little while, there are at least two different interpretations of that parable. And you may say, well, there is also the scripture in Peter where Jesus went and he preached to the souls who were in Hades. Well, there are 200 ways to interpret that scripture. You see, this is not how you build doctrine. You don't build doctrine from passages that are so difficult like these. And definitely you don't build doctrine from parables, from teachings that only show up in parables. Another weakness of this interpretation is, why was Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham? Why was he not in the presence of God? Why was he in the bosom of somebody else? Why was somebody else not in the bosom of Abraham? Is there a shift system for time spent in the bosom of Abraham? Another weakness or a question that could be asked, what exactly was the nature of the torment that this rich man was experiencing? Because if you've ever seen somebody burning in fire, their nerve endings are exposed to the heat. They will be rolling and writhing and screaming at the top of their voice. There is no way they could have a coherent conversation with anyone. This man is having a coherent conversation with Abraham. So maybe he was in a fiery place, but he was not directly exposed to the fire. Maybe he was just in a very uncomfortably hot place. So that is one way to interpret the parable, literally as you see it. But it's not the only interpretation. There is a second interpretation. And before I go on to interpretation number two, I need to give you some more background information. We know that the Jews of Jesus' time believed that departed souls went to a place called Hades and Hades had a torture chamber and a paradise chamber. The question is not whether the Jews believe that. The question is why the Jews believe that. That belief did not come from the Old Testament. If you, if you search the Bible from Genesis to Malachi, you will not find a single verse of scripture that teaches anything remotely close to that. That belief did not come from the Old Testament. So where did that belief come from? Originally, Judaism never taught anything like that. But over time, the Jews became exposed to other cultures. They spent an exile in Babylon. They spent time in Egypt. And then after Babylon came the Medo-Persians. And after the Persians came the Greeks. And the Greeks were the main culprits in spreading their mythology throughout the known world. That process is called Hellenism. That's why the New Testament people spoke Greek. And a lot of the Greek mythology got absorbed into Jewish culture. So the Pharisees came to the fore around that time and they started teaching for the first time the immortality of the human soul. And that when sinners die, they go to Hades where they are tormented in fire. And when the righteous die, they go to a place called Paradise where they are comforted by saints who went before them. And some Pharisees also believed in the concept of purgatory where people on earth could pray for the saints in hell so that they may be saved and transferred into paradise. And again, that belief did not come from the Old Testament. It came from apocryphal writings such as 2nd Ezra. So with that background, let's go into interpretation number two. Jesus, according to interpretation number two, Jesus was not validating 
the beliefs of the Pharisees and the Jews, he was invalidating it. Jesus was using satire and sarcasm to mock them using their own teachings. So the force of the parable would have gone like this. So there was a rich man and a poor man. And the rich man represents you Pharisees because you love the seat of honor. You love to live it up on this earth. He represents you. And when the rich man and the poor man died, the rich man went to hell. He went to Hades. And he was in the fire of Hades being tormented. Ah, ah. And that represents you Pharisees. You will burn in your own hell because you have been rejected by God. And the poor man went to paradise. No, 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 not paradise. He went to the bosom of Abraham. Rockin' my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rockin' my soul. He was mocking them. He was using their own unbiblical teachings to mock them. And there is another part of the parable where the rich man in hell cried out and he said, Lord, please send somebody to my brothers on earth. Remember I told you that some of the Pharisees believed in purgatory, where people on earth are praying for sinners in hell. Jesus is reversing and repudiating that belief in purgatory by presenting the rich man in hell as praying for people on earth. So according to interpretation number two, Jesus was not literally teaching what would happen in the afterlife, but he was using what the Pharisees believed to mock them and to show them how they have fallen from God's favor and they will not be spending eternity with God. So let's talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of interpretation number two. So one of the strengths is that even though this is not how parables are normally used in the Bible, there is another example in the Bible where Jesus used a parable to mock the Pharisees. And that parable just happens to be right there in Luke chapter 16. He gave the parable of a rich man who had a steward who was unfaithful in his dealings. He was wicked. So the master fired the servant. So the servant said to himself, well, I can't beg. What am I going to do? So he struck up a deal with the master's debtors to gain favor with them. And Jesus commended the steward for his shrewdness. And he said sarcastically to the Pharisees, Go and make friends with the unrighteous mammon, so that when they fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. If that scripture never confused you, it's because you never read it. What Jesus was doing here was using sarcasm to mock the Pharisees. In that parable, that unjust steward represented the Pharisees. They were initially chosen by God to safeguard God's law, but they did their own thing. And they fell out of favor with God and they were rejected by God. But then, in order to compensate for that, they sought favor with men. And he's making that very clear, mocking them using this parable. And they knew exactly what he was doing. That's why the Bible says they turned their nose up at him. Well, I have never. They knew that he was mocking them. So there is a precedent for Jesus using a parable to mock the Pharisees like that. And it happens to be right there in Luke 16. So it would make perfect sense if Jesus did the same thing in this other parable. So another strength of this interpretation is that the pieces fit together really nicely. It meshes. All the parts of the parable fit in nicely with stuff that the Jews believed and that the Pharisees taught. But the major weakness of interpretation number two is that there is uncertainty. We can't really know for sure that Jesus was mocking them. We can't even know with 100% certainty what the Pharisees believed. So although there are historical documents attributed to somebody called Josephus, there are people who question what did Josephus really knew? How could he know what the Pharisees believed? And there are some people who even question whether Josephus even wrote those documents. So there are doubts because we are so far removed from it in history. We can't know for certain that the Pharisees believed what I told you in this video and we can't know for certain that Jesus was using their own teachings to mock them. It's sort of like building a jigsaw puzzle in the dark. You could feel that the pieces are meshing together really well. 
But unless you have the visual confirmation, you cannot know for sure. And that is the main weakness of interpretation number two. So, so which one do I believe? Well, I'll be totally honest with you, I'm not 100% sure, but I am leaning 70% towards interpretation number two. But I could go either way on it. In this particular series, I am talking about hell and annihilationism. Neither interpretation contradicts the doctrine of annihilationism. You may say, but how? I know how interpretation two doesn't contradict annihilationism, but interpretation number one, the rich man is being tormented in hell. How does that not contradict your doctrine? Well, annihilationism teaches that sinners will eventually be destroyed and they will perish in hell. The fact that this rich man is in torment does not imply that that torment will be for all eternity. And we know for a fact that Hades is temporary. The Bible says that death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. So people are coming out of Hades. And death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. So Hades, according to interpretation number one, is just a temporary holding hell. All right, but the final hell is called Gehenna, that's the lake of fire where sinners will be thrown. So annihilationism teaches that when sinners are thrown into Gehenna, that is the hell that is the instrument for their destruction. And that is where sinners will be annihilated. So whatever happened to Hades, whether this Hades is really a thing that exists or not, it doesn't really matter because Hades is temporary. And you may say, well, some people in Hades will be tormented for thousands of years. Well, thousands of years, sir, is not eternity. Of course, there are some other questions as well. We already saw how this man was experiencing the pain of fire in Hades. It is different from how people experience fire on Earth. And also, there are other questions like how do people experience time? If you take a human soul, Outside of Earth's gravitational system, how will it experience time? We really don't know the answers to these questions. So all I'm trying to show you is that neither of those interpretations contradict the doctrine of annihilationism or conditional immortality. If this was a blessing to you, make sure you hit that like button and check out for my new videos every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. If YouTube doesn't give you a notification, make sure you search for either my name or the channel name and check out the playlist that I'm creating here of all of my other teachings on hell and annihilationism. And I'll keep adding to it as I go along. Thank you for watching. God bless you. And I will see you all next time.